over 40 years, Rabbi Noah Weinberg has been helping Jews of all backgrounds discover the wisdom and beauty of their heritage. Rabbi Noah was born and raised in New York City. He studied at Johns Hopkins and Loyola Universities and received his rabbinical ordination at the Nair Yisrael Rabbinical College in Baltimore. Today, he resides with his Rebetzin in the heart of Jerusalem. With his trademark warmth, wisdom, and love for all people, Rabbi Noah has become everyone's rabbi touching the hearts of Jews from all walks of life across the globe. I think the secret of happiness can be attained, but if I tell you it wouldn't be a secret. Eat lots of well. cake. Makes you happy. That will not make you happy. Makes that's you true. happy. No, afterwards it will not make you happy when you're in the stomach ache. The secret to attaining happiness is uh, freedom. Uh, live your life every day free. Do what you want to do, because what you want makes you happy. <laughs> yeah. Be content with whatever you have, whether it be a lot or a little. You learn how to accept your lot in life. It's really self-acceptance. Um, love life, I guess. Just don't be sad. It's realizing that you enjoy being happy and that you want to be happy and strive to find out what happiness is about and how to achieve it. To fill the voids in life is to realize there are none. You can just be happy. If you go out and you have five drinks and they're all different and then you come home and you have two more different drinks and then you go and listen to some music which is really old and drug induced and you turn all the lights off and it's 4 a.m. in the morning, that will give you a glimpse as to what the finest type of happiness can be like. Uh, happiness, you know, uh, <laughs> that's what life is about, being happy. And people ask, what's the secret of happiness? You know, if you ask anybody, which would you rather be? Ask all your friends, which would you rather be, happy or filthy rich? Yeah? Everybody will tell you happy. What's the use of being rich if you're miserable? <laughs> I'm a miserable rich man. So everybody knows that you can be rich and miserable, you can be a billionaire and miserable. You can be well-to-do and miserable, you can be well-to-do and happy. You can be poor and miserable, you can be poor and happy. So what is the secret of happiness? What makes us happy? This is the secret of happiness. Now, uh, get rid of a misconception. I'm not going to make you happy. Nobody can make you happy. Nobody can make you happy. I'm going to teach you what you got to do. And you got to work at it, not long, 10 minutes a day, you got to work at it. And if you work at it for 30 days, for 60 days, then you'll be happy. It's like bodybuilding, you know. <laughs> if you think you're going to build your body one time using your, your stretch, one time with no muscles, <laughs> it doesn't work that way. You do it for a year's time, you know you're going to be bigger muscles. And the same thing goes with happiness. I'm going to teach you the secrets. And I, You've got to use it. And it's hard to use, just like a bodybuilding machine. It's hard to use, but you use it 10 minutes a day, 5 minutes a day, you're going to be happy. So this is the secret of happiness. So we're standing on the 70th floor of the Empire State Building. 70th floor. A fellow opens the window, and he's going to jump. Would you try to stop him? Or a young lady opens the window, and she's going to jump. Would you try to stop, stop her? Of course, people have a sense, ah, you've got to try to stop him. So they turn to you, they're uh, six feet tall, seven feet tall, they weigh 500 pounds, and they say, you try to stop me, you come with me. <laughs> I come with you? All right. <laughs> Please, my pleasure. Uh, anybody you want to give regards to, <laughs> you know? So the fellow or the young lady turns to you and says, listen, I see you're a reasonable chap, a reasonable young lady. You know what? I'll give you 15 minutes. Dissuade me. Persuade me not to jump. But first, if you want to persuade me, you've got to know my motivation. Why do I want to jump? So you've got to hear my sorrows. You've got to hear what I've gone through, my ordeals in life. Are you willing to listen? You say, sure. <laughs> Biggest mistake you ever made. This fella, this young lady gives you 10 hours of misery. You're crying your eyes out. <laughs> You're ready to jump with her. Yeah. Finally, after 10 hours of this terrible, tragic ordeals they went through, they say, well, now you know how much I've suffered. I don't want to suffer anymore. Now, what are you going to say? So I'll tell you what to say. This is the idea. You say to them, tell me, if you were born blind, would you be more miserable or less miserable? More miserable. Never see faces, never. 
I don't know what people are doing. I, I'd be more miserable. So you certainly jump. Of course I jump. So you're leaning out the window to jump, and there's a miracle. You can see, for the first time in your life, you see sunshine. You see trees. You see birds. You see flowers. You see faces, human faces. You see the face of your brothers, your sisters, your friends. You see people, yeah? Now, would you jump just now? <laughs> no. Why not? It's fantastic. I can see. Well, what about all this misery you were telling me about? All these terrible, tragic... The heck with them. I can see. So what? You see, you'll be euphoric a week, two weeks, three weeks, you know? Then you start remembering your tragedies and your ordeals and your misery, yeah? By the sixth week, you jump. So you see, the secret of happiness is one thing. Don't get used to seeing. If you can get used to seeing, <laughs> guaranteed, you can get used to being a millionaire. If you can get used to seeing, guaranteed, you can get used to being president of the United States. If I knew the secret to happiness, I'd be a millionaire, I think. That's got to be being true to yourself, really. Because uh, if, you if you're not true to yourself, then you don't know what would make you happy. I think it's to put everything that's not important on the side and try to focus on the good things. Well, I think a million dollars would do, Joe. Don't get used to your pleasures. Now, how do you work that? So now a tradition, every morning you get up, you say, whew, thank God I'm alive. You got to pay attention. Life is gorgeous. Everybody knows it, but we don't pay attention. You have a beautiful day, oh, enjoy it. Say, thank God, and you don't have to thank, he doesn't need your thing, but thank God I have eyes. Thank God my digestive system works, thank God. Uh, I can move my hands, thank God. I can stand, thank God. I can hear, thank God. For my children, thank God for the, for the pleasures you had, for your blessings that you have. And I'll show you how it works. You got a relative that likes to complain? Everybody has one, let's call her Aunt Sally. You know, you're coming to Aunt Sally, and you're going to have two hours of misery. She's going to share with you her lumbago and the doctor that doesn't give a hang, and, and the fact that, uh, if you know that you're going to suffer for two hours, you come next time you come to Aunt Sally, you say, Aunt Sally, for now on, you want me to share your, I came to share your sorrows, but before you share your sorrows, share the wealth. What do you mean? Share your pleasures. You've had some pleasures? Let me hear your pleasures. I haven't had any pleasures. If you're not going to share, I'm going to leave. Oh, she's desperate. She says, what pleasures did I have? You had a cup of coffee? Oh, yeah, I had a cup of coffee. Now I can complain? No, no, no. Drink the cup of coffee. Close your eyes, Aunt Sally. Smell the coffee. Taste it. Was it warm? Was it sweet? And go through that whole experience. She does it for you because she wants to complain. Yeah. After that, she says, I can complain. No, no, four more, <laughs> five pleasures you had today. She goes through five pleasures. You know her complaints will be a heck of a lot less. So for your living, you're married, make up with your wife. And when you come home, the first thing isn't the horrible things that happened to her day, which you're going to counter with the horrible things that you had in the office. Yeah, <laughs> it's not the way to start an evening. You say, look, honey, when I come home, give me three pleasures you had today. And I'll give you three pleasures I had today. That's the way we start. Now, you can't repeat the pleasures that you had. You can't, that cup of coffee is only good for one day. <laughs> so now all day long, you're going to have to think. You can't report the same cup of coffee. So what pleasures did I have today? I mean, you know, you, you, know, you got a contract. <laughs> you got to deliver pleasure. And she's going to be thinking that, you know. So you focus on the pleasures that you have. See, the secret of happiness is take pleasure in the pleasures that come your way and appreciate them and don't get used to them. That's the secret of happiness. Now, if you share it, 10 weeks, five people a week, then you know what's gonna happen? You're gonna learn how to do it and you'll be a happy person and people will love you and you'll love people and you'll have energy and you'll be able to accomplish an awful lot in this miserable world. <laughs>
Every person can make a difference in the world. Anybody can make a big difference if they choose to. But it's that choice that's the hard thing. Can one person make a difference in the world? Everybody knows you can make a difference in the world. Every, it's not only that, everybody knows that he's responsible to make a difference in the world. That there's something wrong if he's not making a difference in the world. Let me show you. You see, if you ask somebody, um, isn't it terrible what's happening in Chechnya? Isn't it terrible what's happening in, in, in Ethiopia, the famine? Isn't it terrible what's happening in, in uh, Indonesia when they're killing each other? Isn't it terrible in Rwanda? Isn't it terrible? Isn't it terrible wife beating? Isn't it terrible ba baby, battered babies? Isn't it terrible the drug problem? Isn't it terrible? And everybody says, yeah, 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 yeah. terrible, terrible, terrible. Oh. Every, every human being feels these things are terrible. So what are you going to do about it? Me? Huh? What can I do about it? You'll never have someone saying to you, me? Why should I do anything about it? I didn't do it. You know, if a guy, if, if, if you walk into somebody's house, you know, if somebody walks into your house and he spills, he spills, uh, uh, you spill ink on the floor and you say, hey, why don't you do something about it? He says, I didn't do it. What do you want from me? Yeah, because he doesn't feel responsible. But when you ask him, what are you going to do about world misery? And what are you going to do about the, the, the problem of Israel? What are you going to do about the tenure? What you... Nobody's going to say, look, I didn't do it. What should I do about it? Why should I do anything about it? They say, what can I do about it? If I can and I don't, then you can condemn me. So then you say to them, tell me, uh, how much time did you think about it? Everybody knows that if you were really suffering through the starvation in Ethiopia and you saw people dying, and when you got back you'd be telling your friends, hey listen, we should organize something, we should do something. People are dying, it's miserable. You, you wouldn't be indifferent, but it's so far away. Rwanda, it's so far away. You know what? Naibola said in Germany, when they came for the communists, I said, I'm not a communist. When they came for the Jews, I said, I'm not a Jew. When they came for the Catholics, I said, I'm not a Catholic. When they came for the liberals, they said, I'm not a liberal. And then when they came for me, there was nobody left. <laughs> the way you, you raise your kids changes the world, and, and you know, the way you, every action that you have has a reaction. And that has a, you know, a reaction that goes on down the line until it changes the world, you know, the ripple effect. I think with today and with the technology and the communication we have today and the impact, I think one person can make a huge difference in, in the whole world. When you feel that all of us are your brothers and that people who are suffering are worthy of your commiseration and your effort, then you've got to do something. You know you've got to do something. If you know it strong enough, and you work hard enough, and you believe that there is a good will amongst mankind that you can fire up, we can change the world. You can, you can help people who are in famine. People have done it. You, you, can, you can help people who are, who are being murdered. It's been done. The United Nations has been forced into action sometimes, yeah? We can do it. Every individual can make the difference. If they really mean it, and they're ready to think about it, and they're ready to feel it, and they're ready to act to the extent they can act, things can get done. It's your responsibility. Don't always go for the money. Take a, take a job which you're comfortable with. Do something which can do a lot. Be a writer. Something that can give you enough money that you like doing. <laughs> Whatever's going like, to make you the most money and whatever you don't have to work very hard at. That's definitely the best way to choose a profession. Like you want to think about like how can I do the minimum amount of work in the minimum amount of time and make the most money at it. Well, first know yourself. You say, what do you want? You want to be rich? If you want to be rich, don't become a teacher. <laughs> it's, it's not. You want to be rich in changing people's lives? Hmm. Teachers, you have a certain amount every year. You can influence them. They're, they're ready. 
maybe, but maybe if you know what you want, then you choose the profession. Now, you got to make a living. So, unfortunately, the way we pay teachers, that's a terrible thing. I mean, we all know that's one of the most important professions there are. And we're looking for the idealists. And we're looking for the best quality. And we're looking for people who are wise. And we're looking for people who are committed. And we're looking for people who are strong. And we want to pay them peanuts. <laughs> but their idealists who figure they're going to make a living by working at night, that's how they become teachers, yeah? But then what are you teaching? You're teaching one grade in a, in a, in a, in a system that, that is teaching them what? Values, character, <laughs> or reading and writing arithmetic? You know, so what are you, what are you gonna teach? The point is that in every aspect of living, you gotta know yourself. In choosing a profession, you really got to understand yourself thoroughly. If you can't live without a certain level of income, even though you're wrong, yeah, don't become a teacher. So how are you going to help mankind? You got to do it by going on the uh, Parents Teachers Association <laughs> or by lobbying for better salaries in, in the teaching profession. Uh, do what you love. Do what makes you happy. Whatever you really hate, don't do. Look into all kinds of things and even try out a lot of things until you decide what you like the best. But you got to understand yourself know what you want and know what you can deal with and the problems you can deal with and what your talents are. Know yourself and then carefully look at the different professions and what it deals with in each of your desires. Help mankind, make a lot of money, uh, be famous, help mankind, change mankind. You know, where you come from. That's the way you choose your profession. nothing. That's it. Barely anything. Probably not a good person to ask that question. <laughs> I do too many foolish things. A foolish person will do what like, will benefit them now and not what will benefit them in the future. And the wise person thinks ahead. The wise person knows something and he knows that he knows he's right and a fool thinks that he knows something when he really doesn't. The proper study of man is man himself. If you don't know what you're living for, you don't know why you fly off the handle. You don't know why you lash out at your wife and your children. You don't know. You, you can understand yourself. That's wisdom. People who are into um, understanding how to fix the plumbing, <laughs> or how to fix um, uh, the heart, which is very important things, yeah? But they're not wise. Are they fools? No, because every human being gathers some wisdom while he's living. They gather wisdom. In Judaism we say, honor the old man, even if he is a peasant. But if he's old, if he's over 70, stand up for him. That's the Talmud. Why? The Almighty has taught him wisdom. He knows what it means to bring up children, to have a wife, to be sick, to get better, and then he's learned about life. We do learn about life. A wise person can learn from the mistakes of others. Who wants to find out for himself? A wise person is somebody who can admit his mistakes, and a fool is somebody who cannot. A wise man thinks, says little, and does a lot. A fool opens his mouth all the time, says so much, but does nothing. A wise person's smart, a fool will walk around with one shoe on. The fool is somebody who <laughs> you know, in America they have a saying, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. That's a fool. You learn something and you ignore it, <laughs> that's a fool. You stumbled on something, you, you lost your temper and you feel terrible about it, and you didn't do anything about making sure you don't do it again, that's a fool. A wise man stumbles once, but he learns not from his mistakes, but he learns from other people's mistakes. You know, just stumbling, they're hurting. The pain of failure one time makes him say, I'm going to find out how to avoid this again. A wise person lives in reality. 
Whereas a fool can't be bothered to go and search in reality for certain things. I think a fool talks too much and a smart person knows when to talk and when not to talk. A wise person's always thinking ahead. Then a fool is somebody who just does things quickly without thinking. So you see, a fool always thinks he's very wise because he knows, he knows how to deal with everything, you know. You just ignore it. <laughs> a wise man knows, darn it, I, I, I got to get more of my potential out there. I've got to learn how to put people at ease. I've got to learn how to enjoy life. I've got to learn, I've got to learn, I've got to learn. And he realizes there's so much to learn and so little that we really know. Because we can do so much and life is so beautiful. No matter how beautiful we feel life is, we haven't even begun. And no matter how much we've accomplished in life, we haven't even begun. A good person is someone who does the right thing, but what does that mean? Uh, the meaning of a good person is to live a life in happiness and freedom, and to explore and discover and contribute to the world. To me, a good person someone who tries to do the right thing. He tries to avoid doing bad. A cool guy doesn't like, you know, act like he's better than people and stuff like that. A person who does the right thing for the right reason. A good person is someone who tries hard at everything he does. Everybody wants to be good. <laughs> We're driven to be good. The fact is we'll die to be good. How do you see that we'll die to be good? Because you ask anybody from the civilized society, you say, would you kill a thousand innocent hostages that aren't throwing stones at you, nothing. They're innocent hostages to save your life. They say either you kill them or we kill you. And everybody would say, I mean, you, you won't find one person who will say, I'll kill a thousand. Maybe if you say, would you kill two or three or four for <laughs> a thousand? You say, why not? Don't you want to live? Yeah, but it's wrong. Well, <laughs> did you ever do anything wrong in your life? Yeah, but it's too long. I would never kill a thousand children in order to preserve my life because there's just no way I could fathom living with that guilt. Absolutely not. Kill a thousand innocent children to save my life? No. So we all know that we're willing to die to be good. The good man finds out what is this good. It's got to be powerful. He doesn't ignore it. He gets a definition, and he works at it. And not only that, if you're willing to die to be good, live to be good, and you're a darn fool if you don't learn how to enjoy being good. It's bracing. It's pleasurable. It's strength. It's eternity. A good person is somebody who seeks to do what is good that's considered by the entire world for all generations. First of all, it's good to themselves and wants other people to feel and understand that good. Someone that cares about others the way they care about themselves. Someone who does more right than wrong. You know, you're not doing everything right, but you're not doing everything wrong, and you're, you know, you're leaning towards the uh, doing the right thing side. So you're good. You have any questions or any comments, anything at all, we're interested, please call. Cool.